Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to business sitting there for magic potions destroying me friends stealing his one Well I'd just like to put in there thanks very very much Kevin Hester for the uh, this week's uh, extinction report which was on the previous hour and uh, and we're looking forward to uh, next week's extinction report no matter what the bad news is we do want to hear it uh, Sean uh, are you back with me I am indeed uh, and I believe I have uh, Jack uh, from uh, the nuclear resistor newspaper um, uh, are you there Jack well let's see if my microphone works here is that good Fantastic. How, is that a good setting for you, Jimmy? That's pretty good. I can work with that. How are you, Jack? Well, and welcome to well, European News Weekly. Well, thank you, Jimmy. I'm well. I'm well here. It's about nine in the morning in the Sonoran Desert. It's about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 or 40, 30, 33 or 34 centigrade, I guess. A oh. lovely day. So, so, uh, so you have a bit of uh, air conditioning going there, do you? Well, actually, in our home, we have what we call evaporative cooling. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know how that works, but they add moisture to dry air by pulling air through a uh, saturated medium, and it cools the air. But unfortunately, when the dew point rises, then you can't add as much moisture to dry air, and all you get is sort of a soggy mess. But at least the air is moving in the house. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Well, I'm pleased to hear that. That sounds really hot. Um, did you, okay, did well, you say I, I, Sonora there, Jack? Uh, are you down Mexico way? Well, Tucson in Arizona is about 60 miles from the Mexican border. Okay, okay. And the state, the state of Sonora, Mexico. And, you know, I, I am, I'm not active on, you know, border issues, but I have many good friends who are quite involved, you know, dealing with the issues that arise with the border, both environmental and human and political. And, yeah. So that's a bit of a subject. So that's where we are. That, yeah, certainly a subject down that part of the world. So uh, a very uh, heated subject as well, I believe. Yeah, well, and there's some interesting parallels with, you know, the immigrant issues in Europe as well. Yeah, no, certainly we've, uh, we've uh, been uh, messing up our neighbors, and I think they want to come over here and, uh, and get a job and stuff, so it's, uh, it's hardly too surprising. Well, really. it's, not yeah. ju it's not just that, Sean. I, I think they're running in terror from that machine that's been created out there uh, via proxy uh, by English and... Uh, American and God knows who else, and they're streaming across the border in, in in terror and fear, and I can't blame them. I really can't blame them. Which which would bring me quite nicely to the nuclear resistor and 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 what you do, Jack. Uh, yeah. it, it, it would seem that um, you're basically a newspaper. Um, you post to prisons. Uh, you yeah. post to activists in prisons. Uh, generally to do with, uh, would I be fair in saying, uh, peace and anti-nuclear activities? That's correct. Okay, yeah. so, I mean, uh, with that in mind, and we're obviously talking about all the, the wars going on around the world and the uh, the flack that activists seem to be getting, there certainly seems to be more uh, journalists uh, being killed and uh, imprisoned, and uh, it seems to be also the case in many countries that activists are also having the same problem. So, yeah. Could, could you kind of give us, I mean, you obviously must be really knowledgeable about this area, one would think, and would you be able to give us a kind of a synopsis of, of the kinds of uh, cases that, that your newspaper is dealing with and, uh, for now? Yeah, just give us that, that little bit. Well, since we have, you know, a little, bit, a little bit longer form here, maybe first I could talk about, you know, where we began. Sir. No, certainly. All right. 
Uh, you're back. You're, yeah, you're back, Jack. Yeah, I think. Uh... Oh, I lost. You lost me. Okay. All right. I think. I think we were just. You're going to give us some uh, background of uh, where you started yes. and what you were about. Yes. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, my wife and I both were in, got involved in the anti-nuclear movement in the late '70s. Um, the movement against nuclear power that had direct action movement inspired by activity in Germany principally and then around the globe, and then in the early '80s. You know, the well, actually beginning again in the late 70s, the anti nuclear weapons movement. And in that context, um, I became aware with a few other people I was active with at the Rocky Flats plutonium factory outside of Denver in the late 70s that people were going to jail who were engaged in these nonviolent direct actions. And I'd already been involved in prisoner advocacy and writing to people in prison and visiting prisoners. And I kind of had an interest in bringing these two issues together somehow and recognizing that in this movement for social change that was just coming into, a, say, a new generation, the anti-nuclear movement, there had been nonviolent direct action against nuclear weapons going back to the 40s, of course, and all in the intervening years, but in the late 70s, the anti-nuclear weapons movement kind of got another boost and so did the anti-nuclear power movement. And bringing those two movements together, seeing that there are people in prison, looking at history and recognizing that certainly in the United States, in any significant movement for social change, people had gone to jail, whether it was people who were risking imprisonment um, consciously, you know, like ferrying slaves to freedom in the North, or uh, people who were caught up in the injustice of the system because they spoke out, you know, for justice. And we looked at the anti-nuclear movement as, you know, another developing social movement. People were going to go to jail. And if the movement as a whole does not recognize that there are people in jail who are very committed, then you're losing the voice, the, the power of those activists. And they're already isolated in prison. That's part of the point of prison, is to isolate people from the rest of society. So a movement to succeed needs to recognize its prisoners and support them. So that was the foundation for starting the work of the nuclear resistor. And if you go like way back, we didn't have the name the nuclear resistor for the publication. It was just a handful of people and we called ourselves the National No Nukes Prison Support Collective. That's, that's a big mouthful. So now the work is just the work of the nuclear resistor. And in 1990, you know, so we, so we chronicled basically through the 1980s, we chronicled thousands of arrests every year in the United States in the pages of the nuclear resistor. And then when people ended up in jail, we reported on those court proceedings and the addresses of the people in prison and encouraged the movement to write letters to them and to engage in whatever other support the prisoner themselves might specifically need. You know, and interestingly enough, one of the differences perhaps in this movement from other political movements that, you know, have and recognize their own prisoners is that most of the people who are in prison in this movement have really, you know, kind of acknowledged that that's where they're going to end up or that they have a good chance of ending up in prison. So once they're there, they're rarely... Um, crying out for relief from conditions of confinement or that sort of thing. And predominantly, they're, they've been white in the United States as well, and so they don't suffer the racism, you know, that's overwhelming in prisons as well. Um, so that's, as an aside, just sort of a distinction about the kind of prisoners that we generally write about in the nuclear resistor. Um, in 1990, when... The United, when uh, the Gulf War issue arose, um, we decided that we needed to expand our coverage to both anti-nuclear and anti-war actions because a lot of the same people and communities were engaging in nonviolent direct action uh, against that first invasion of Iraq in the January of 1991. Are you guys still hearing me? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah you're fascinating. I'm, uh, uh, the story okay, well, because I, uh, I can wax on, but I don't want to exceed, you know, my welcome well, here. <laughs> I've, got, I've got one little question while I have you here. Yeah, go ahead, stop me and interrupt, because you know well, this is kind of a history that I'm, I'm just trying to bring us up to date here. Well, yeah, did, no, well, well, this show is about you, Patrick, and about the nuclear resistor. So you hog away to the airwaves to your heart's content. Uh, myself and Sean are only too happy to sit back and listen. Uh, for sure. I, I will ask, do you have Mordecai yeah. Vanunu, in, uh, who's uh, in prison in Israel? Well, yes, let's let's go ahead and I'll have to back up prior to 1990 because I had skipped ahead to 1990 when we decided that we would expand sort of the, the editorial bailiwick to include anti-war activity. Sure. Um, in 1986, uh, we had just moved to Tucson. We were only here a few months living in Tucson when we read a very small bit in the paper about the allegation that one newspaper in England was making uh, that there was someone who from Israel had spilled nuclear secrets and was being hunted. And then a few days later came the actual revelation in the Sunday Times of Mordecai Venunu, who had been an employee at the, the Demona nuclear weapons facility in the Negev desert in Israel. And as a technician, uh, he had some access to the area and his conscience, you know, had been stirred, I guess, uh, as an immigrant, uh, as, as a brown-skinned immigrant in, you know, the Israeli settler state. Um, he had taken a camera into the Demona facility because he worked a night shift and he went down to the levels where they actually did the machining of the parts, the plutonium and the uranium parts for nuclear weapons. And he took photographs of these glove boxes and he took photographs of dials and gauges and, and processing rooms. And then he left the employee of, uh, he, he was made redundant and uh, kind of went hitchhiking around the world for a few months and eventually gave these photographs to a reporter for the Sunday Times of London, and that led to the revelation and the confirmation of Israel's nuclear weapons program in the fall of 1986. So we read about this and thought, oh boy, that guy's in trouble. <laughs> and uh, he was. And we have followed that case since then. And in, in the 1990s, we were very involved with the veteran journalist and activist, the late Samuel Day in the United States, who rekindled the original efforts in the United States to bring attention to Mordecai Venunu that were made by uh, an American girlfriend of his in 1986 and uh, some other scientists. Sam Day rekindled this uh, effort to free Mordecai Venunu in the United States uh, in the early 1990s. And um, my wife traveled to Israel uh, as co-coordinator, associate coordinator of the campaign to free Venunu. Uh, with Sam Day several times, and by herself as well. And then Sam Day unexpectedly suddenly passed away from a stroke <clears throat> in January of 2001, and my wife and I took over the uh, coordination of the U.S. campaign to free Venunu for the next four years until after his uh, release from uh, prison to internal exile in Israel in uh, 2000. Astounding. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually amazing to be able to speak with somebody who's got first-hand knowledge of the revelations of the, uh, the Israeli nuclear uh, uh, arms ability. It, it, this is astounding. Well, it was quite an astounding thing when he, when he, made the, when he had published these photographs because the Sunday Times of London properly vetted the photographs with experts in the nuclear field, people who knew nuclear weapons, you know, technology in Britain, and uh, had them inter one of them interview uh, Venunu as well prior to the publication. So this was quite a revelation. It was, because uh, even, to, even to this day, Jack, you know, it's surprising, like, how much speculation is out there on the internet concerning whether they do or whether they don't. <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, yeah, it's just it's just it's just muddying the water of, of perception, you know, to continue that myth. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's in uh, he's in uh, uh, internal exile, it's called, uh, but he's not allowed to leave Israel. 
Uh, that is correct. Yeah, he's that become a Christian, correct. I believe, and he, he wants to leave. Uh, his... Well, that is correct. He converted to Christianity while he was in prison. And there's actually a collection of his letters that Sam Day published um, that he wrote to the Australian cleric um, who befriended him before he revealed the photos. And so if you look at it from the eyes of the Jewish state, the man was not only a political traitor, but he's an apostate. And it's, uh, my wife tells me from her travels in Israel that it's un, at times it's unclear which was the greater crime for the patriotic Israeli you know, Zionist, whether it was the fact that he was a traitor you know, to the nation or a traitor uh, to his religion. So yeah, he had converted to Christianity uh, while he was still in prison. And now he was released, as you say, with a whole set of restrictions. And these restrictions are subject to renewal every year, and they have been renewed every year. And they basically forbid him from having any contact, uh, meaningful contact with foreigners. They forbid him to talk to journalists, and they forbid him from approaching any border or embassy or to go outside the area of Greater Jerusalem, you know, without prior permission. And on several occasions over the now 14 or excuse me, now 11 years since his release from, you know, actual lockup, he has been arrested. And in the latest issue of the Nuclear Resistor, uh, we have a wonderful photo that a person at a cafe uh, in Jerusalem happened to snap as Venunu was taken into custody outside a shop because he had allegedly had too long of a conversation with foreigners. Um, you know, he, he has argued in court, well, how do I know if a person is not an Israeli? There's people who are Israelis from all over the world. Um, how do I know if a person is not a journalist? How can I know these things? Uh, he, is, he was actually in prison for three months on one occasion, and I believe a less period of time on another occasion for, you know, convictions for violating these extreme restrictions on his freedom of speech, his freedom of movement. Is to contact. The only bright spot, I guess, I could say for the for the uh, in the last few years is that he would met um, a biblical scholar, uh, a Norwegian woman, and they were recently wed. I'm not sure how they managed to negotiate the legal stuff because she had even been kicked out of the country at one point for just talking to him as a foreigner. Um, but they have been wed, and so he at least has some closeness and happiness in his life I can presume. Oh, well thank you for telling us about that because that's that does give us a little bit of uh, a heart for him and we do hope yeah. one day that his his right to uh, to uh, move around uh, you know which yeah. is enshrined in the Human Rights Act uh, will be upheld one day. Yeah and Israel says that you know there's some secrets to tell that he didn't tell all that he knew. And he's, of course, always alleged, well, I told you all that I knew, more than I knew, more than I had a right to know. I went, where's, I, you know, other places I shouldn't have gone, I took photos I shouldn't have taken, but I don't know anything more. Mm. And frankly, if Israel is concerned about the security of their weapons or their, their technologies that he might reveal, this was in 1986, this is almost 30 years ago. It, in fact, it was 30 years ago that he took the photos. It was in 1985 that he took the photos. So if they haven't improved things since then, you know, it's their own damn fault. Well, uh, I think from what my investigation of the nuclear industry is that they probably haven't. They're probably still running the same reaction. <laughs> oh, that is, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the tragedy, yeah. Yeah. No, there was a story out recently about Demona uh, uh, polluting uh, down windows, uh, who just happened to be Palestinians, I believe. But uh, anyway, yeah. that's another story for another time. Um, right. Well, I mean, you know, so uh, what was your impression on, on what's happening in, say, the last 10 years since the war on terror? Uh, ha has your uh, schedule got busier? Well, it certainly has peaked at, at times. Right now, it's at a bit of an ebb because I think in this country there is war fatigue, there's war protest fatigue because it's been seemingly endless for at least the 14 years since 9-11. For some of us who have been paying attention, 9-11 was 10 years after, you know, we really began to muck it up in the Middle East. Sure. In this generation, I'll have to qualify that. And, 
you know, when I when I saw the you know the twin towers coming down on television, you know, a rare time that I turned the TV on in the morning when the kids were getting ready for school. Yeah, I looked at what was going on and I said, kids, you know, this means that, you know, your government is going to make a mess of this and it's going to, you know, mess up parts of your life forever. The way that our government is going to respond and it's kind of played out. Yeah, no, quite right. It was, uh, unfortunately, you're right. And uh, I suppose... So I suppose really you're sort of saying there has been little peaks. And do you think all the bad publicity surrounding Sister Megan Rice has uh, uh, helped the American government to sort of back off a little bit from their um, uh, slightly uh, uh, strong-arm tactics uh, in dealing with that, uh, protesters? Um, no, I don't. Uh, there's a distinction in how the government deals with, you know, the kind of prisoners that we report about, generally speaking, which is a little bit lighter than... Um, people in their social movements, maybe. And certainly the profile of somebody like Sister Megan Rice helps protect them from certain abuses of incarceration. And the fact that the prosecution was defeated on the issue of the sabotage charge that was brought against uh, Megan and her co-defendants, Greg Borcha Obed and Michael Wally, they had originally just been charged with trespass and destruction of government property. And then uh, when they didn't agree to a plea deal, uh, the government issued a new indictment that included this sabotage of the national defense charge. And it was that charge that a, an appeals court uh, recently threw out, and the government decided not to appeal uh, that win. And as a consequence, with that conviction gone and, and thrown out, the three of them are now awaiting a new sentencing. They were released from prison because the remaining crime of um, property destruction carries a shorter sentence than they were uh, already serving. So right now, there are not really people pushing and testing, you know, the system within the anti-nuclear movements and the anti-war movement, as has been the case in the past so often. You know, when I look through older issues of the nuclear resistor, there's times when there were dozens of people in prison serving, you know, six months and more. And that's not the case that we see now. Uh, if I had to really draw, draw a generalization over 35 years of working on this, um, the introduction of this form of protest and the persistence of a certain you know, number of people in the, in the 80s and the 90s did lead to some longer prison sentences. But I don't see that same persistence and um, you know, in the face happening now or maybe in the last few years, certainly. There's exceptions to, to these. I'm just making generalizations, and we can talk about some of the exceptions. Um, so I don't, I don't have a sense of repression in the sense of political repression of the movements that we report about right now. That's not to say that it wouldn't happen, um, but the uh, practice of nonviolent direct action as a tactic in the struggle for nuclear disarmament in the United States has significantly diminished over the last, you know, few years. Uh, and Megan and Greg and Michael stand as a bit of an exception to that. And they are older people. They are veterans of the movement. There is a question, and as academics have looked at this, you know, issue since it's now an older movement, there is a question of, of this sort of action, these plowshares actions, how much might be continued, whether there will be a new generation of people who maybe see this in the way that the plowshares activists for the most part see it themselves these are prophetic actions these are not you know mechanical actions where they expect a political result b from their action a these are actions that are on a on another plane of you know political and social dynamic well i i, I mean i might put another slant on this uh, i mean yeah. for instance we had chris uh, professor chris busby on earlier and he's doing uh, legal cases for the uh, British nuclear test veterans. Yes. So, uh, the bottom line is, is that he's, he's suffered a lot of issues, um, some of which we've reported in the past, and he's just recently told us that he's got a £3,000 fine near enough to pay about $6,000. Um, and um, so basically they've done that as a punitive uh, measure to try and uh, just uh, uh, squeeze him. So my major point here is like the Stasi in East Germany, that what they did, they stopped imprisoning people, but what they do is they isolate you in your own area. 
So there's, there's different tactics being used. And then, of course, we've got the revelations of Snowden about the types of technologies they can use. And then we've got other uh, re revelations coming out from hacking yeah. files about what corporations are also involved in these surveillance and spying and uh, harassment uh, uh, campaigns. So do, do, do you find there's an uptick of that kind of thing? And of course, there's the protest uh, clampdowns as well. That's going on worldwide. Um, so uh, are you finding that maybe the, 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 there's different tactics being used by the government and uh, corporations in order to? Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think there. Yeah. And they certainly are, are interested in, you know, suppressing dissent, generally speaking. But I also I do have to recognize that there is a sort of a, like I say, an ebb in the the tide of our activism on the issues particularly that we cover, the anti-war and the anti-nuclear issues. Not that we didn't fill, you know, 16 pages of newsletter last time with news. Sure. Uh, um, but um, when I look back to the 80s, when I look back to periods of time since 9-11, when there have been thousands of people, you know, in the streets in, in hundreds of cities, you know, around the country, that sort of public protest uh, and the, the, the use of the nonviolent direct action has diminished. But, you know, so, so the other forms of repression, let's look at the couple of the prisoners that we've reported about in the nuclear resistor. Um, one who was just uh, released um, from prison last December and another man who is still in prison. Uh, Rafael Defir is an Iraqi American oncologist and he's serving a 22 year prison sentence in the United States now for humanitarian aid in violation of the sanctions against Iraq between 1991 and 2001. Wow. Or 2003, I guess. Raffle Defer worked in a clinic in upstate New York and was a leader in the local Muslim community. Um, he's, a, you know, conservative. Muslim spoke out against the sanctions in his, you know, affecting his family and friends back in Iraq and organized a charity and sent money back. He was arrested a month before the 2003 invasion of Iraq with a lot of fanfare in upstate New York about uh, arresting funders of terrorism. This was right before Colin Powell's speech to the UN, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, the kind of finally put the, you know, the, put the last shell on the gun. I was like, let's go. You know, we're going to war. Um, he was held without bond. And he is now, he has not been out of prison since he was, he's not been out of custody since he was arrested. He was denied bond many times before he finally came to trial. When he was arrested, they seized all of the records at his home, home in his office. They interviewed at least 150 other Muslims in the Syracuse area that day. The FBI did. Um, to try to find out more about the charity. Once they had seized all his office records, they did what the FBI does really well. They make a financial crime out of alleged criminal activity. And so with his office records seized and the prosecution, they added, you know, dozens of new charges of Medicare fraud alleging that he was not in the office at times that he should have been when certain procedures and medications were administered to his patients and therefore not entitled to the Medicare reimbursement that he had been that he had claimed and, and received. And so it was on the basis of, of 59 convictions, nearly all of them having to do with, you know, this alleged white collar crime of defrauding Medicare for these cancer patients. Mm -hmm and a few charges related to violating the sanctions. And the, the government alleged that that's where all this money went, but in fact, you know, the evidence at the trial showed that he donated much more of his own legitimate income to the charity than he was accused of receiving fraudulently from Medicare. And yet he was sentenced to 22 years in prison and he was, all of his appeals have been exhausted. His reduction of sentence appeal and effective use of counsel, you know, appeals, et cetera. His habeas corpus, his final appeal has been exhausted. Raffle Defer is serving, you know, essentially a life sentence. He has another 10 years. The man is in his late 60s, and, and no one gets better health-wise in prison. Sure, um, sure. That's a terrible and, story. That. Uh, and, we're, we're and, and, he's, and he is just one of a whole number of Muslim philanthropists, 
who have been prosecuted in the United States under the guise of terrorism. And mind you, he, although, although even the governor of the state talked about him as a terrorist, the word terrorism was not allowed to be brought up in his trial because that wasn't the criminal charge. Uh, right. He was just tarred with that brush, but unable to defend himself when push came to shove in that environment. Okay. But that was the reason Bond was denied, was because, well, there's, he was funding terrorists. Well, who are the terrorists? Well, you can't know what happens to the money when it goes back to Iraq. Well, he said, well, I know, into my family. He went to my friends' families. Wow. So, and, and there was another man, uh, shot, and, and we supported Raffle Defer because he had been outspoken about this depleted uranium issue in Iraq, and he had been outspoken about the war during the sanctions. You know, he was a public figure. And another, another man in Columbia, Missouri, Shakir Hamoudi, a, a, an astrophysicist, earned his doctoral degree, brought his you know, family, raised his, his family here in the United States, um, ran a business, a wonderful import food business in Columbia, Missouri, was a leader in the Muslim community, was, spoke out against the war, and likewise sent money home to his family in Iraq. And years later, 2006, five years after, you know, three years after it was no longer a crime, he was prosecuted again, the same charges that, that Rafael Defer was for violating the sanctions. And he fought it quietly. He didn't go public with it, even though he had been a public figure in Columbia, Missouri, anti-war voice in Columbia, Missouri. He didn't go public with this prosecution and, and try to raise a defense. He accepted it quietly and served three years, in, or two and a half, but he got a three-year sentence in federal prison just for sending money to his family in Iraq during the sanctions. So that is the way that the anti, the, 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 this, these new ways of repression have come into the prisoners that we support um, in the nuclear resistor, you know, currently. Right. It's people like that, yeah. Certainly in need of, uh, of support by the sound of it as well. Yeah, yeah. We have so, a we, we have, have a, a we question, have a, Jimmy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have a question, but this is coming in from the the chat box, and uh, Delamitri is 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 just uh, because we have quite a unique site here, Jack, and uh, a lot of people are are working on these issues of legalese and uh, and words and the meaning of words, and and the and he's making the point here, just Delamitri, to protest in legalese is to grant full consent but to grumble now uh, he, he follows on by saying governments love uh, protesters uh, it empowers them to swing the baton and he did add a little bit later I might use the word objector as no con uh, this is uh, it looks like a misspelling to me but he says has no conscientious objector uh, was ever sent to war Well, I, what my conscientious objectors have been sent to war at the point of a bayonet, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard some strange oh, stories yeah, come yeah. from Russia, like, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't heard yeah. such now come from the States now, but I haven't heard the, uh, the US military shooting their own because they wouldn't march forwards, but um, maybe it has happened, I don't know. I don't know how much we've heard about it. No, exactly. You know, I mean, I mean, they're... they're, they're there are crimes and secrets in war that we've heard about, and there are a whole lot that we've never heard about. So I can't say for sure that that does not happen in recent years in U.S. wars. Okay, well, you, uh, know. you know, I can respect you uh, being coy yeah, with that yeah. response. Yeah, yeah, I can respect that. Yeah, but and I guess I don't know if I didn't catch the very beginning of what you were saying, Jimmy. Oh, yeah, um, but basically what Dell is saying to protest in legalese. Uh, basically, mean it means to grant full consent, but to grumble. Well, I I agree, and that's 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 why I wanted to be involved in this prisoner advocacy advocacy because I recognize the nuclear state. Those two words are tied to one another, and those who resist the nuclear weapons are resisting the instrument of the state. Period. And if you're going to challenge nuclear weapons, some of us Hello? I think 
has Jack dropped? The, it's fine uh, to talk about we, this. We just we just lost you there. Just for a second, uh, uh, Jack, uh, w would you rewind just one or two uh, sentences, um, perhaps? Uh... Yeah, I, I'm saying that the nuclear state is just that. They're tied together. If you challenge nuclear weapons, you are challenging the very existence of the state. You got that? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, I, and, I hear you, yeah. And one should expect that somewhere in a movement that seeks to delegitimize nuclear weapons, the message that we are delegitimizing the state is implicit and the state will react to that. And that's why we wanted to support the people in prison that we knew that when push comes to shove, people go to jail because they're challenging the very foundation of the state. How, how many sort of people are you dealing with at the moment well, on your books at this low, low spot? Um, just like about a, a half a dozen or less right now. Oh, so that's, that's really interesting. So it's... Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, certainly one guy I can talk about is kind of your uh, one aspect, a more traditional type of nonviolent resistor uh, who's in prison for anti-war activity, and that's a guy named Norman Lowry. And he's in a state prison in Pennsylvania. And he could be out, but he won't promise not to go back to this military recruiting office where he's visited three times and um, peacefully protested and asked for an end to war and talked to the young men and women about why they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. And then he refuses to leave. The first time that he did it, he broke some windows on the vehicles that the recruiters drive around, but then he stopped that and he just went in and kind of sat in the doorway and then sat inside. But he told the judge that, that that's what has to be done, is people need to be present to speak out against war to the very people involved. And now he's in prison because he won't promise not to do that. So, so he's, he's, he's serving he's the maximum. He's basically in prison then because he won't, uh, he, he's been found in contempt. Would that be correct? He's been found in contempt and he won't purge his contempt. It's not specifically a contempt citation but it's it's a situation where the judge imposes conditions of a sentence and says when you agree not to do this in the future we will let you out of prison right up right. until up up until the maximum of the sentence and because they consider him a repeat offender three times um he got a maximum up to seven years maximum and the judge said you're free to go if you will just promise during that seven years you will not go back and do this sort of thing and that's, he said, no, I can't make that promise. That's real commitment, isn't it? And, and Yeah, and this is a man, he's a Christian, or at least, you know, heavily influenced by Christianity and believes that there's a, that, that there's a purpose in being among the least and the most oppressed in our society, listening to them, understanding, not just reading about, but feeling and being in the experience of and sharing it with the most oppressed and to try to bring into that incredible atmosphere something of light and humanity you know love you might call it and so his character is, is you know akin maybe to some of these plowshares activists who understand that, that part of what they're doing is the prison witness that you know the population the, the percentage of people imprisoned in the United States is greater than any other country at any other time in history, even the most repressive regimes. <laughs> so, admittedly, we aren't slaughtering them by the hundreds of thousands, but we're just imprisoning hundreds of thousands. Sure. And uh, I think that this could also be a factor. The experience of imprisonment has only become more and more difficult. That's the reports that we get. I, I've never been overnight even in prison, but I've visited a lot of prisoners. I've talked to prisoners over the years so much that the experience of imprisonment in the United States, both at a county or state lockup level, as well as in the federal system, has generally become just more and more severe and repressive, even within the prisons. And so it takes a certain amount of you know, intestinal fortitude to say, I can buck up for that <laughs> as part of the cause. Sure. You know. And, and then there's people that have to buck up to it as part of the cause because they get wrapped up in something that uh, was bigger than they are and more involved than they are, like cops who infiltrate protests and instigate violent activity. 
Sure. You know, there's a there's a young man, Jared Chase, who's in prison in, in Illinois right now, who we write about in the nuclear resistor because he was wrapped up in an undercover operation at the NATO summit. And our, we look at this context, well, this was an anti-war protest. You don't protest NATO because, you know, they sell bubble gum. You protest NATO because they sell weapons and they, you know, from a war. Sure. That was an anti-war protest. He got wrapped up by cops who wanted, wanted him and a couple other guys to help build Molotov cocktails and uh, plied them with drugs and alcohol, found the vulnerable personalities within this milieu and wrapped them right up. That's, that is, that is, that is, is still, Jared is still in prison. And that's, yeah. the, that's, I, in, I, that's insightful in a sense when you think you're inciting vulnerable people into acts of... Uh, well, whatever, like, you know, we, we, some might call it, like, uh, violence, but, like, it's coercion. At, at, yes, it's entrapment. We have a legal term. Entrapment, that's the word. That's entrapment. It's terrible. Bloody it's hell. Tough. Yeah. Picking on so, vulnerable people. It's it, that's, it's scandalous, yes. you know, what, uh, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not shocked, but, you know, but just, that's just what it is, you know. Uh, it, it is. I mean, it's part of the tragedy, and and these are just the prisoners that we write about because the circumstances of their imprisonment drew our attention. I, we send the nuclear resistor to any prisoner who would like to receive it for free. Period. Um, just a question. Um, can I can I ask a question? Um, I don't yeah. know if you've got any uh, numbers on this, Jack, but because I have a little bit of experience of what it's like on the inside, and. Okay. Uh, when you're sending mail to prisoners, uh, how can you be sure that it's actually reaching its destination? Uh, have you any figures on on uh, how many people are actually, really do receive your mail who are on the inside? Um, we're pretty, we do, like all the, the prisoners, the other prisoners, not the political ones that we concentrate on and write about, the other prisoners who receive the newsletter, the nuclear resistor, I check in with them at least once a year to make sure they're still receiving it. Before we start sending it to a prisoner, we send them the first issue and say, you're going to have to let us know that you received this and that it didn't end up in a you know, trash bin. Mostly, I believe that the newsletter does get through, but we do have a file folder of prisons and jails where the newsletter has been rejected, usually because it talks about other prisoners and it publishes other prisoners' addresses. And some prisons have a pretty strict rule. You can't talk about other prisoners or, or you can't write about other prisoners when you're writing to somebody in their joint. You know, they don't want communication between the joints because, ooh, well, you might have coordination of protest or whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we think that the nuclear resistor does get in to most of the prisoners who would like to receive it. Um, some mail doesn't happen. I mean, once we got, I think they must have changed staff in the mailroom. A, a newsletter, this, and this was before we were checking in as regularly with all of these other prisoners on our list. We, I got a note back from a prison in Missouri that said that the man had been executed like five or six years earlier. Mm. And we'd been sending the newsletter and they'd just been popping it in the circular file there in the corner of the room. Huh. You know, the bin. And... Um, so that was that was unusual. That was a little disconcerting, and that's the reason we said we really need to keep in touch with all these folks a little better. And so we have. Yeah. Sure. And uh, <coughs> well, I, I, uh, my, my my one of my areas of interest is the Fukushima disaster and the victims of the uh, Fukushima disaster living in the area. Yeah. Um, uh, have, have you got uh, any Japanese activists on your uh, on your books at the moment? Well, I, we do currently, and unfortunately, haven't been able to get any more information than what was initially reported in the press, because it seems that this would be what they would like to call a lone wolf, someone who is acting, you know, on their own. Uh, Yasuo Yamamoto uh, is a Japanese guy who took an interest in um, drones, and un, un, you know, remotely piloted little <laughs> aerial vehicles with cameras on them, oh. and in in April. He took a drone and went to the Fukushima prefecture and collected some, you know, radioactive sand off the beach or something and put it in a little vial and strapped the vial to a drone with a camera on it, I guess, or at least a cargo drone. I don't know. But 
from the photographs, you know, just you might have seen these small quadrocopters that are just, you know, a couple of feet across. And he flew this over the official residence of the Prime Minister of Japan and landed it on the roof. <laughs> we reported and this they, story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might have heard about this because yeah. that made the news. And unfortunately, we've not been able to get, you know, I've, I've asked a number of contacts in Japan, but we don't have like a really extensive network of people and I don't speak Japanese. Um, and there may be a cultural thing I don't know or understand that, you know, not to, you know, come out and support. Maybe he does have a support c committee that's developed and uh, in the next month I will be looking into it again more in depth as we get ready to publish our next issue to see if we can find any more information. But he was charged with, you know, violating the airspace and assaulting the I forget now. I'd have to go back and read the story. a nuclear plant, probably. Plant, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we should be able to help you with that. Uh, get some uh, more information on that, and I'll uh, I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, well, yeah. If you, if you do find more information, because the last you know what we were able to find was that that he was indeed in jail, mm -hmm. and uh, but writing to, you know, some countries have different rules about you know being in contact with prisoners, like. Sure. Just to take Japan, for instance, if you are sentenced to death in Japan, you and your family do not know the day of your execution until it arrives. Whoa. Right. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what happens to other prisoners there. I, I think the prisons, uh, prisons in Japan are quite uh, harsh, especially for uh, uh, sort of probably for what would be construed as sort of a left wing anti commie um, or anti yeah. Sorry, I should say. Yeah. Um, but uh, having said that, more than 60% or 70% even or even more of the Japanese people are anti-nuclear, so God willing, he's having an easy time in there. Well, right, I do hope that he's got some sympathy because that, uh, for that reason. And yeah, he, he did make a clear public statement that the police reported. He said, you know, that he w it was to express his opposition to nuclear power, and he thought that he could gain public attention if he used the drone. It worked. It did. And he says, I chose a method that was more apparent than a demonstration, but not as shocking as a terrorist attack. Sure. That's fine. So, it was a very peaceful and uh, amusing in some respects. Yeah, Ironic yeah. Uh, sort yeah. of action, if you like. So, Sean and Jack, yeah. um, we have approximately eight and a half minutes. This is just a little heads up. So, I suggest now is a great time of any essential information that Jack needs to get out. I think now is a good time to do it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I could certainly refer readers to the blog that we keep. And I will say that although we have a blog where we regularly post, you know, new reports of actions, etc., um, the, the, the focus of our work is on the newsletter itself, and it remains on that print newsletter because that's what we can send to the activists in prison and to the other prisoners. And they, you know, the activists appreciate it. And... Yeah. Actually, other prisoners really appreciate it, and we've gotten the most touching letters from other prisoners who say, it's so good to know that there's people who care about issues out there. It's so good to know that there's people who think about how they want to live their lives, and now I'm thinking about how I want to live my life. So we do, that's why we publish in print. The blog is not as comprehensive as the newsletter. If you really want to get the full coverage of stories and particularly the follow-up, you'll have to go to nuclearresistor.org and you can click on the subscribe button there for the information about subscribing. And you can even click to download our current issue from our website and read it yourself online and you'll understand that the stories that are published in print are, you know, better, more tightly edited than what we're able to produce regularly on the blog. We often just reproduce press releases and, and other media reports on the blog. Uh, well, we follow I, I, up. I would say uh, that uh, for those out there that can't see, obviously it's a radio, the, the, uh, the, the, the actual paper itself, it comes lovingly crafted with uh, drawings. That uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a bit of a artwork uh, as well. And uh, it is a joy to, uh, to feel and hold and look at. Uh, well, thank you. As well as, <laughs> as, well as the content. 
So I would certainly recommend people to uh, download, it, at the very least, uh, the uh, the copy. You know, print it off and and enjoy the artwork because um, you know it's it's certainly a, a a lovely thing to see. That's all I can say. Well done. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, that's that's what I would encourage people to do. Number one, the other thing about our blog that we do do, and and this is where the blog is especially valuable, is we keep a list of the prisoners and their addresses up to date. We only publish the newsletter itself quarterly, but in between, we're always updating with a change of address or a new prisoner or someone getting out on the blog. And you can click on the prison addresses, and there's where you can find the names and the addresses of people. Drop them a line. Uh, Dr. Raffle DeFeer, you'll find his address there at the prison in Massachusetts. Uh, the end of Ramadan is coming up in a week. It would be a wonderful time to send just a quick note of support to him. Right. And, and, and other... could, could we just say that uh, when people uh, go to the, your, your nuclear resistor, um, uh, website uh, blog that uh, they would get instructions on on you know whether you have to put the uh, notes onto cards or uh, the, all the instructions for the, the you know sending um, yeah uh, it's not detailed there but basically here's here's a quick summary um, cards and letters only no photos no enclosures keep it simple um, and write in, in pen or pencil, write your address both on the letter itself as well as the return envelope. That's very important because sometimes the envelope is separated from the letter before the prisoner has a chance to get it. Okay. Um, and, and, and otherwise, that, yeah. That would also be part of the rules for the hospital, uh, for the prison as well, I take it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly for writing to anybody in prison. You should make sure to, to put your return address on both the envelope and the letter itself. Yeah. That's great advice for many people uh, in many walks of activism, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of funny sometimes when you, when you realize, well, wait, how do I get a hold of this person? <laughs> yeah, I know, totally. Yeah. So, well, look, thank you so much, uh, Jack. And uh, well, can we have you back again at some time in the future? For, well, for a check bit of in and see where we're at. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fair to ask, and I'll let you know where we're at that week. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, you know, it's been great and uh, really an enlightening uh, show for many people, I'm sure it's going to be. Um, thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing with you. And good luck to yourself and Felice uh, in your hard work and uh, any supporters that are uh, running around the background there helping you out as well. We we have a lot of support, as well as the financial support of a very small but loyal readership. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to your listeners as well, Sean and Jimmy. Uh, thank you and, very, uh, very much. And carry on with your work, too. Indeed, Jack. And I, I tell you, from, from, from me also, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure having you on. It's been great to hear from somebody who is actually supporting people who are incarcerated and... Uh, trying to uh, it, 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 it's a different aspect of uh, activism really and I, I'm impressed with what you're doing I really am and uh, you know and, and I'm looking forward to having you back on Jack well thank you thank you best wishes good luck good luck yeah indeed indeed uh, yeah 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 peace all right so uh, so Jimmy that's uh, that's uh Coming up to the end of the next hour, I suppose. Uh, We're coming up to the top of the hour. That was that was a fantastic uh, conversation. Uh, uh, well done, Sean, for for bringing Jack in there. That's and the nuclearresistor dot org. Uh, don't forget, people, go and check it out. There, there's. Uh, I was looking there today through. They have a, an archive of letters and stuff that correspondence from people who are inside. And uh, there was Chelsea Manning, there was uh, Sister Megan Rice, and all her cohorts who were uh, amazing documentation. It's it's amazing. Worldwide. It's amazing. Like you know, so well worth a visit. It's not an extensive website, but it's it's functional. It's uh, it's concise and. Uh, you know, very, very well done, Jack. You know, I think we're running two minutes late. Um, I, I suspect. No, we're not. I'm, I'm reading 1758 here. Okay, all right, okay, all right. So, I was just wondering. Um, uh, so with that in mind, then, I suppose this has been a bit of a, a mind blowing hour. 
Um, we're basically uh, going to be getting on to the next hour where we've got even more mind-blowing uh, interviews uh, Whoa, uh, coming yeah, up. Um, that's for sure, yeah, that's the, for sure. In the Irish section. And, yeah, um, you yeah. know, if you're, if you're at the end of this and you're wondering, uh, you know, if you want some good human interest stories and, uh, you know, sort of topical stories, um, I would say hang on for the next hour, although it's Irish-specific. Um, it's also specific to all of us, uh, much like most of the discussions from around the world we've been having uh, about ju judicial issues. Um, they, they're, uh, they're all tying up with TTIP and the other uh, trade uh, deals, so uh, they're things that we have to be looking out for. Um, and uh, having advice and uh, exchanging stories with people from around the world, activists um, who are dealing with various pressures, um, it's important for us to know about these, to support one another, uh, to try and help one another as best we can uh, because uh, we're a very uh, s small group unfortunately and uh, I would say you know need to share things, you know Facebook is clamping down on activists and promoting uh, paid for advertising um, so we need to share links, we need to be talking to this about our friends and family it's getting ridiculous now all the things that are going on uh, to own it and we need to move on uh, to a brighter future. Thank you very, very much, Sean. So we're now doing our outro. We have a new format and we have our intros and outros sorted. So.